When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring a something that will bless and will bless your I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one could express. How much you deserve The one we can pour All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required Search much deeper within through the way things are. You're looking into my eyes. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. great time to get to know people better um, and we want to congratulate Sophie Stevens and Josiah Hunter they got married yesterday um, in a beautiful ceremony out on the family farm uh, there was no rain no bugs and a little bit of wind but uh, just ask the Lord to bless their wedding or their uh, their marriage to come uh, family camps next weekend we have Mike Maharder uh, from the fellowship office as a guest speaker, so we're looking forward to that. Registration closes tomorrow, so if, uh, if you're still thinking about coming, uh, you better talk to one of us, or, uh, or you can still um, register online. So church next Sunday is going to be out at Rockness, so don't come here, because um, we won't be here. It's out at Rockness, still starting at 10 o'clock, um, and over the last few months, uh, we've gone through our um, denomination's ordination process with Jared, and uh, Jared wrote a paper on multiple issues and stood before an ordination council made up from the denomination, um, the seminary, and elders. And based on what has been observed and tested, um, the ordination council has put Jared forward for ordination, so that's great. Um, so the ordination will take place next Sunday, while we're at Rock Nest, and Mike will uh, be, be doing that service. So it's going to be a, a really exciting service, so please come on out for it. Um, there's not going to be any live streaming next week, but um, there will be, it will be available online as of Monday night. We just won't be able to do it from the church. And after the service, um, we'll have the Sunday school picnic. 
So uh, lunch will be provided and there'll be games for the kids. Hopefully decent weather. And uh, since we're having family camp next weekend, there won't be any youth or men's breakfast next week. Okay. Any other announcements? That's all I've got. Thanks. Do people have to bring salads? No. We're going to make some big salads out there. So all the food's going to be provided. Any other questions or comments or announcements? Okay, great. Our scripture reading today is Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you have given us, that we can come together as a family of believers. And Lord, we thank you that we can come together in person and online to just fellowship with you, Lord, to be able to sing songs to you, to pray to you, and to spend time in your word. And Lord, we thank you for your creation. Everything that we see in the heavens and on the earth, you have created with your hands. And we thank you, Lord, that you do not change, that you are the same God during, from creation that you are today, and that you will be in the future. And we thank you, Lord, that your love and your, uh, just thank you, Lord, that your love and goodness and faithfulness never change. That no matter what's going on in this world, no matter what's going on in our lives, you are faithful and you are good. And we can rely on you, Lord. And Lord, we th thank you for Pastor Jared. We thank you um, that he stands on your word in his teaching. We ask that you would give him strength today as he brings us your word, and that we would hear those words and put them into action in our lives. And Lord, as we think about the collection coming up, we thank you for the plentiful, um, the plenty that you give us, Lord. And we think about, we ask that uh, the little bit that we give back to you would be a blessing to your, your uh, ministry here on earth. Lord, we thank you again for this day, and we ask that you would bless our time together in your son's precious name. Amen. Maybe we can stand and sing together.
give us your heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. God, let us be the generation that sees your face, oh God of change. surrounding me let it break let your name still the call the sea to still the rage in me to still every wave let your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus, the silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, breathe. I call these bones to live. I call these lungs to sing once again.
Stairs, and we'll sing one more song together. I love 
Good morning. I have a mentor and a friend that I have the pleasure of meeting with on a regular basis. He's in his late 80s, and uh, he's been in some pretty awesome leadership positions. He's often able to lend insight into situations in my life. This week, as we talked, he reminded me that even after all these years of faithfully pursuing God, he still has to be reminded of biblical truths and learn lessons that he thought he already knew. And perhaps you can relate. This is something that often really frustrates me. How can I once again be struggling with something that God has already brought me through before? How can I be so fickle? You know when you're wrestling with a child and you need to restrain yourself? Like John and Grace love to wrestle, but they're two years old, and I weigh nearly 200 pounds more than them combined. When I'm wrestling with them, I need to be very careful to make sure that fun playing doesn't turn into accidental injury. I use the kid gloves, so to speak. But this week was one of those weeks where I feel like I was in a fight with someone much larger than me, and they took the kid gloves off. I kept getting knocked down, and every now and then I was dealt another blow. Have you ever been there? Perhaps some of you have been feeling that way lately. As I was speaking to my friend this week, he drew my attention to a great passage, one that I want to examine together with you today. So please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 
4 through 7. And if you're able, could you please stand with me this morning as we reverence the reading of God's Word? Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can be gathered together. Thank you for your great love toward us. Thank you for your word. God, this morning I pray that you would remove any obstacles in our minds and our hearts, that we would be able to listen, to hear what you have for us today. Remove anything of Jared. Let your words be heard. Let your truth be taken to heart. And Lord, may your spirit work powerfully in our lives today. We thank you for this time. We commend it into your hands. Thank you that we can faithfully trust you to do what you've promised to do, what you delight to do. Amen. You can be seated. Oftentimes, it seems that we don't need to learn something new but rather we need to be reminded of that which we have learnt before. And this morning, whether this is all new to you or it serves as a reminder, I hope that you can treasure God's words and take them to heart. In our text today, Paul is listing instructions and exhortations, challenges and encouragements for the Philippian Christians. And though these are separate instructions, they pair well, and I think that they're worth considering altogether. Firstly, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Right away, I want to remove any obstacles that we may have in listening to this instruction. Of course, when we read something like rejoice and always, again I say rejoice, our brains start getting creative and arguing that perhaps words like rejoice and always actually mean something different. The word used here for rejoice means to be glad and rejoice. Webster's 1828 dictionary defines rejoice as to experience joy and gladness in a high degree to be exhilarated with lively and pleasurable sensations, to exalt, and to make joyful, to gladden, to animate with lively, pleasurable sensations, to exhilarate. This is what Paul is calling Christians to, to experience joy and gladness, to experience pleasurable sensations, and to be exhilarated in the Lord. And as if this isn't a big instruction, he adds the word always. The word used here for always means always, at all times, ever. In other words, at all times, for all of forever, you should rejoice in the Lord. Paul's instruction here isn't based upon reasonableness or life circumstances. This is despite whatever's happening in our lives, it's always and forever. Remember, Paul faced all kinds of hardships and difficulties in life, and he still gives this instruction. In fact, I think that Paul is revealing to us one of the secrets to his faithful service and his relationship with God, rejoicing no matter what happens no matter what difficulties you face. Because we don't find our gladness or our joy in our circumstances, but we find the ability to rejoice in Christ. And that's what Paul says here. He doesn't say rejoice because of the beatings that you're enduring. 
He says, rejoice in the Lord. That's the key. That's his focus here. It's on Christ. That means that we can rejoice even when horrible things happen. Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord when you're shipwrecked. Rejoice in the Lord when you're falsely imprisoned. Rejoice in the Lord when you're whipped and scourged 39 times. Rejoice in the Lord when your burden for the church is crushing. Rejoice in the Lord when people hate you and say all sorts of evil things about you. Rejoice because he is good. Rejoice because he has saved you. Rejoice because no matter what anyone does to you on this earth, they can't change the way that God views you and how much he loves you. You're never going to be beaten or slandered enough times to lose your salvation. You're never going to be hated or attacked enough times to lose your adoption as a child of God. There isn't a situation in this world that you can go through that will remove your inheritance in heaven. We need to stop focusing on the difficulties and remember the great things that our God has done and His great love for us. We need to rejoice always because our rejoicing isn't found in ourselves. It's in the Lord. When I started my role as lead pastor in this church, I shared about something that I have made people do in my office, at home, or here in the church. Something that an influential pastor in my life learned to do through great difficulties. And so, of course, on one Sunday, I stood up here and I made everyone participate in this practice. And today we're going to do it once again. To help us remember that our joy is in the Lord. So today, whether or not you feel like it, I ask that if you're physically able, you would stand with me, and on the count of three, we are going to jump up into the air. We're going to put one or two hands in the air and yell, yeah, yes, amen, or woohoo. This is called a leap for joy. It's a physical reminder of a spiritual truth. So stand up. I understand some of you can't jump as high as others. That's okay. And the great thing is we're all embarrassed together. We're learning to let that go this morning. So on the count of three, jump up. One or two hands. Yeah, woohoo, amen, praise God. All right. One, two, three. Yeah! <laughs> One, two, three. Praise This is a practice that would be something good for you to institute in your life. When those late night moments come, when the weight of the world is crushing, can you leap for joy even when your circumstances stink? We can. We can because our joy, our reason for rejoicing is the Lord. Secondly, let your reasonableness be known. I don't want to spend too much time on this point this morning, but this instruction is only possible if we are finding our joy in the Lord and rejoicing in all circumstances. The word used here for reasonableness means gentle, mild, forbearing, fair, reasonable, moderate. So Paul is saying, let your gentleness be known. Let your fairness be known. And honestly, we don't really live that way or show that kind of behavior or that character if we're busy complaining, grumbling, feeling sorry for ourselves, or getting angry about our circumstances. But if we anchor ourselves in the joy of the Lord and we learn to rejoice at all times, then our gentleness and our reasonableness will be able to be known by everyone, as Paul instructs us here. And in so seeing, they would see that there's something different about our nature 
and they would be led to pursue Christ. Is your gentleness, is your mildness known? Thirdly, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. This is a two-part declaration by Paul. Firstly, just as we examined last week, Jesus is returning and his return will be at a time that none of us know. We do know that we're supposed to live as if his return will be at any moment and to be alert, to be active, to be ready. And secondly, our God is a very near God. This, the Lord is at hand. At hand means near. His return is near soon and very soon, the apostles said. But we know that our God is also a very near God. He doesn't leave us or abandon us. He doesn't leave us on our own to face the trials of our life. He is our helper and our refuge, our strength, our shield, our mighty fortress. He is our healer and defender. And these are just a few of the names that are used for him in the Bible. We also know that God sends his Holy Spirit to live inside of believers to empower us in a variety of ways. And so in both of these ways, our God is very near to us or at hand. And it's because of this glorious truth that Paul continues on with his exhortation, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. And just like that, all of our problems were gone, <laughs> right? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. And this is one of those instructions in the Bible that can become a painful annoyance. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm tired of trite Christian sayings. I'm tired of Christian platitudes and motivational bumper stickers and posters. I'm tired of hearing about people going through horrible things and being met by well-meaning Christians with simple statements like, the Bible says don't be anxious and just praise God, so that's what you have to do. If you're here this morning and you're hurting, you're wrestling with pain, confusion, difficulties, and trials beyond what you can handle, and you're feeling anxious, scared, or concerned about the future, I'm sorry you're going through that. If I could take that all away somehow, I would try. But regrettably, I'm not able. But please believe me when I tell you that we have an all-powerful God who can do anything. There's nothing happening in your life today, and there's nothing that will happen in the future that's beyond his ability to show up in a meaningful way. What we're examining today isn't just some biblical truth that we can throw at people who are hurting. It's a powerful and beautiful promise of something amazing that God delights to do in our lives. We're talking about a great exchange. A great exchange. Paul says in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Again, Paul is saying that our circumstances don't matter. Not what we wanted to hear. It doesn't matter how bad things get. And again, this isn't coming from someone who's never experienced hardship. This man went through more than most of us could even imagine. In fact, this letter was written by Paul while he was imprisoned. Even so, he tells us that not only is our rejoicing not based on our circumstances, but that regardless of what's happening in our lives, we should not be anxious. Dictionary.com defines anxious as full of mental distress or uneasiness because of fear of danger or misfortune, greatly worried, apprehensive. Paul says, don't be full of mental distress. Don't become uneasy. 
Don't allow fear of danger or misfortune to overcome you. Don't become greatly worried, no matter what happens. It's an incredibly steep instruction, an impossible one. And I fail at this point way more often than I would ever care to admit. It's an area of constant repentance and growth in my life. However, in the rest of this verse, Paul gives us the power behind his instruction of do not. But. But. In other words, he's saying instead of being anxious, do this. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. In everything. The word Paul uses here for everything means all, the whole, every kind of. So in every single thing that happens, in every moment of life, in every circumstance we find ourselves in, we move forward with prayer. Paul says prayer and supplication. So not just asking for God for help or for stuff, supplication, But Paul separates these two things. In other words, we don't just seek God to ask for stuff, though we definitely can and should do that. He isn't some kind of a genie. We have to have a prayer relationship with him. We need to be people of prayer. And not only do we come before God with prayer and requests, but we come with thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I can feel pretty beat up by Paul in these few short verses. He says to rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. He says to let others see my gentleness and reasonableness. He says not to be anxious about anything. He says to be in prayer. And he says to come before God with thanksgiving. All of this, no matter what's happening in my life or how I'm feeling. Doesn't Paul seem a little too cold or callous here? I mean, we aren't robots. We can't possibly live this way. And yet, we know that this is the word of God and that God carried Paul along to write these words and that God has fully endorsed them as truth and that they pass all the tests of truth. And if you don't know that, I'd love to talk to you about it sometime. So if the problem isn't God's instructions, because he's wise and perfect, and the problem isn't Paul or his instructions, because he actually lived this way, and God gave him these words and approved them, then there's only one other option. And our pride absolutely hates this one. The problem is us. Do you remember one of the definitions I used for wisdom a few weeks ago? Wisdom is the ability to live in right relation to how things actually are. The ability to live in right relation to how things actually are. Far too often we fail to live in the wisdom of God. We fail to see how things actually are. We allow our minds and our hearts to tell us what truth is and to guide us. But the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful and wicked and that we can't trust them and that our natural disposition, our natural state is to be a fool and trust in our own understanding. In this text, Paul is trying to help us understand and live in right relation to how things actually are. He's trying to pass godly wisdom on to us to help us grow. This was Paul's desire for the Philippian Christians, and it's my deep desire for each of us in this local church. And so, along with rejoicing no matter what, and not being anxious regardless of what happens, Paul tells us to come to God with thanksgiving. Again, not dependent upon things going well, We come to God with thanksgiving thanksgiving even when things are hard, even when we're hurting, even when we're broken and beat up. Not because we're necessarily thankful for the difficulties and the pain, 
but because we are thankful for who God is and for what he has done. We're thankful for the salvation that he freely gives, for his mercy and grace, for all the blessings that we still have even when things are tough. We thank him because he is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. And we thank him because no matter how bad things may get in our lives, we're still blessed more than we deserve. We still have the love and grace of God that we could never earn and that no one can ever take from us. We have the greatest treasure of all time, and no difficulties can ever remove it. And we're thankful because God has promised that when He returns, He will call us to Himself so that we can be with Him. And the Bible tells us that in heaven there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more sin. What an amazingly incomprehensible promise for us to cling to. And on top of all of that, Paul says something else here. He explains to us a great exchange that takes place when we come before God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, not being anxious. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. We can let our anxieties go because God will give us peace. We can come to Him with thanksgiving because He is our comforter and our hope. We can rejoice in all things because our guard, God will guard our hearts and minds. We give our anxiety to God. He gives us peace. We give our complaining and our grumbling to God. And He guards our minds and hearts. Again, like everything else that we examine, it's not about our abilities and our resolve and our strength and our intellect. It's about Christ. It's about a God who loves us and a Savior who gave up His life for us so that we could be saved. We don't drum up or work up this peace for ourselves. God creates it and gives it to us. All we need to do is surrender. All we need to do is come to Him in humility, asking for His help and thanking Him for who He is. Then He makes the great exchange. He takes our anxiety and He gives us His peace. He gives us Himself. What an amazing thing. And like a soldier or a sentry standing guard over a city for its protection, the peace of God will stand guard over our hearts and minds to keep the troubles of this world from disturbing them. When we're continually surrendered and in prayer, giving our anxieties to God, He will continue to give us His peace that guards us. Not only are we incapable of finding this peace on our own, but it it says that it's far beyond our ability to understand. Meaning that it's beyond what our minds could ever produce. It's supernatural. And the beautiful thing is, That when that feeling of peace fails and falters in our lives because we've become thankless, prayerless, and self-focused, all we need to do is return once again to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and allow Him to renew our strength and to bring peace once again to our troubled and anxious hearts. Dear people, no matter where you find yourself this morning, The truth is that we all need God. We need Him desperately. We need His power and strength, and we need His peace. And what a beautiful thing that He delights to give us His strength, His joy, and His peace. Houston Baptist Church, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. 
The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as a people aware of our weakness, aware of our failings and our falters, aware of our need for you. Lord, forgive us as a people for our sin. Forgive us for the things that we've done, the ways that we've treated one another and those in the world around us. Forgive us for the distractions in our minds and hearts as we pray and as we hear your word proclaimed, as we sing worship to you. Lord, you know how fickle we are, how quickly we walk away, how fast that slow fade really is. Forgive us. And thank you, Lord, that you've promised to forgive that if we're faithful to confess, you are faithful to forgive us of all of our sins, to cast them as far as the east is from the west. Lord, do that this morning in us, your people. Cleanse us, wash us, renew us, strengthen us, and Lord, take our anxiety away. Give us peace. We live in troubled times. We live in a troubled world, a broken world full of broken people doing hurtful, broken things. And it's hard. But Lord, you see all of it. You see our tears. You know our pain. And you love us. Lord, take our anxiety. Give us your peace. Guard our hearts and our minds by the power and the work of Jesus Christ. Bless us this day as we go forward from this place. And Lord, be with this time as we shift into communion and to remembering the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Amen. We are going to take communion. Communion is a form of worship. We obey Jesus' instruction to remember the cross and His sacrifice As we take communion, we think about the great sacrifice of Christ, the significance, what it really means for us. We think about the suffering and the sorrow, but also about the freedom, the victory, and the joy, the peace. Communion is meant to be taken by those who have repented of their sin and believed in Jesus Christ for salvation. If you have not done that yet, just pass the plates by. And if you are not saved or you are living in sin, do not take these elements. As the Bible says that you will eat and drink condemnation upon yourself. To help us get our focus on remembrance, I want to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, 45 to 54. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, the tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion... And those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, Truly, 
This was the Son of God. Ask the servers to come forward for communion. Mike, you're going to pray for the bed. Uh, no. Father, as we prepare to take communion, we are humbled that your son died for our sins. Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for the sins of the world, for our sins. He was a sinless man, and yet he is paying for our sins. So, Father, help us to reflect on our relationship with the Son, on our, on our heart, and on your love. And thank you, Lord, um, for the love that you have shown us in sending your Son to the cross. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
that reflect that we have been bought with a price. Thank you, Father, for providing that work. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. stand together and sing this last song.
face Whatever the fear Whatever the cost You'll always draw near Whatever the pain Whatever may come Whatever may fall Raise a victory shout For the King will make things new And every mountain move Every lie be loose For your banner we're lifting high For neither depth nor height Nor any life could ever cast your love aside And every wall will break All the darkness that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love or peace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go in peace and join us downstairs for fellowship.